Okay, we're going to talk about the Black Letterman portfolio allocation here. The main difference with the Black Letterman allocation is it takes into account the manager of the portfolio's views on where they think the stock is going to go. We're going to calculate the risk and find a portfolio that's allocated on the efficient frontier. But we're going to incorporate additional features such as our views and the confidence in those views in relation to where the stock is going to go for the future. So to do this, we're going to import, install the same packages from before, Y Finance and Pi Portfolio. Let's just give Google here a second to connect and we should be good. Okay, excellent. So we're going to download Pi Portfolio, import uh, the usual suspects, as well as uh, these packages here. And we're going to be using the same symbols as we did in our last video, talking about mean variance optimization. Uh, you probably don't need to do this many, but I think it's a good way of just analyzing how these methods work. So let's download the data for both the portfolio and our symbols here. We're going to grab SPY, which is an ETF of the S&P 500. We're going to take the adjusted close for each of those uh, symbols there. We're going to grab the market capitalization for each of those stocks as well. We'll need that when we run our, um, our Black Litterman allocation to get the weights. So here we're going to calculate sigma and delta. Uh, the sigma is doing a covariant shrinkage on the portfolio that we created using the Leduit Wolf method. It's just a it's just a particular form of shrinkage as you, as you can read here. So this is our delta 2.09, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can create a heat map of the correlation between our our shrinkage here. Um, it's typically a good idea to visualize what it is that you're doing. You can see that it's sort of red and blue and all in between. There is some, like you can see Microsoft and Apple here are really highly correlated. Meta and Apple are really highly correlated. And that just makes sense. And you can, and Amazon. So you can see these tech stocks are really highly correlated, but like AbV, which is a, I think it's a bio, biopharmacy company. Uh, yeah, they're not correlated well with the different tech stocks. So now we're going to calculate our market prior by passing through the market capitalization, the delta and the shrinkage that we just, uh, ran up here in the previous cell, right? So when we plot our market prior, what we're saying is how much are we going to be compensated per the risk that we're going to take for allocating on this stock, right? But this alone doesn't integrate any of our own expertise in the matter. So if you have personal expertise in where you think the stock is going to go, you get, you need a way to integrate that into the into this process. So here we can create a dictionary with our symbols and we can place our you know where we think the market's going to move. So for example, Apple 0.10 that's a positive. We think Apple's going to move in a positive direction, uh, 10 percentage points, right? And for, say, Disney, negative 0 0.23. So there's a negative where our view is that Disney is going to uh, go short, right? So we can now for this is just for demonstrative purposes. I just picked random numbers and threw them in there. Um, this is not based on anything other than me just picking random numbers, but in real world example, obviously you would want to you know, sit down and think, 
you know, what are your views on this stock and where do you think it's going to move? So the next thing is creating confidence in where we think these are going to, how confident we are that these stocks are going to move in the direction that we think they're going to, they're going to move. Now you can plug in absolute values for your confidence, or you can calculate one standard deviation intervals that will capture 68% um, that will contain the true return 68% of the time. So we're creating confidence intervals here of one standard deviation. And this is sort of random. I just did the first 10 and then I copied it over for the, the last 20 or for the last 10. So I only, this is very, this is repeated confidence in the intervals. It's not based on anything. And you can, we'll pass through our intervals. We'll calculate the sigma of the upper band and the lower band just by subtracting it from an, each other, dividing that by two, appending our empty list with the sigma that we just calculated squared, right? And then when we print it, we place that into a dio, uh, diagonal array, and we call that our omega. So we can pass through, we can do BL again, uh, just by, you know, we're, We've defined our risk aversion, we have our market capitalization, we have our shortage, we have our absolute views in the view dict dictionary, and then we just calculated our omega here. So now we're going to estimate our returns. And these are our returns based on everything that we just put into the BL model here. We're going to pass that into a data frame. This is what the data frame looks like. This is the prior, the posterior, and our views. And we can plot that to visualize because you can see where you, your views are of each stock. You can do the calculation of the stocks, the market, the estimated implied returns of the stocks without integrating your views. And then the posterior performance, estimated performance with our views integrated into them. Um, so it's important that your views are accurate and well thought out and actually based on some expertise. We're getting some pretty wild results here uh, simply because I was putting in random values. I actually thought that Disney was going to do very poorly, but the confidence on it was uh, not very strong. So it sort of evened out and we have a positive posterior estimation of the return. So. That, that's a good example of what it is that we're doing here. You, you can believe that it's going to go negative, but if you can even that out with less confidence or you can, you know, strengthen the posterior view if you're extremely confident that it is going to go in the direction that you think it's going to go into. But let's see what the actual allocation uh, based on an efficient frontier. We're going for the max sharp here. And these are the weights for each of our stocks that we're looking at for a max sharp portfolio. We can put that into a pie chart and after we've cleaned the weights and this is a very big pie chart. Let's get it a little smaller. Um, so yeah, zoom out a little bit. You can see here sort of if we were in a pie chart, how it would all be allocated together. And another way of visualizing it is to do it how we did in the mean variance. And you can see that we're going to have mostly Caterpillar and Amazon in our portfolio. We're going to have a little bit of Apple uh, as well. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we'll have a little bit of Apple. I don't know what this line here in the pie chart is. But you can, you can see that how it's weighted. Uh, Caterpillar, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. Get an annual volatility of 24, expected annual return of 14.2, sharp ratio is 0 0.5. So if you remember in the mean variance, uh, you, you kind of want a higher sharp ratio to determine that you, it's, it's going to have good returns. Um, and you can see here that it's pretty low, and, and that's because we've integrated our views with it. And that's it.
I hope uh, you guys found that interesting. And if there are any questions, let me know in the comments. And I'm going to keep doing some more finance, uh, quant finance lectures here. So I hope you enjoy them. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.